bara så att de... Jag, jag vill gärna säga någonting innan vi börjar. Det här kommer att webbsändas och ni vet de här bestämmelserna kring att man måste ha tillåtelse för It's a great pleasure for me to greet you all. Welcome here. My name is Tapio Salonen. I am one of the pro vice chancellors here at Malmö University. And um, as you know, uh, we, we are a young, urban, striving university, which became fully fledged university this year. And so we will. Uh, 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 with this new status, we, we, we really want to uh, emphasize uh, many of our uh, general themes at our university. And so this seminar series, the Knowledge for, for Change, uh, highlights these uh, 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 topics. And, and uh, we are very proud to have uh, uh, internationally well-reckoned scholars uh, as lecturers and uh, uh, today's uh, topic about uh, digital digitalization and link to democracy questions and so is indeed one of uh, the most important issues at our universities um, and to present our distinguished uh, Speaker, uh, I will leave the floor to Jay Bolter, who was one of our guest professors from uh, Georgia Tech. So give Jay a warm hand. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for that uh, round of applause. I have the honor now of introducing um, our speaker for today, Professor Van Dyke, who is the distinguished a university professor at uh, the University of Utrecht, where, uh, which is for her something of a return to her roots because she, was, she began her academic career as a, an undergraduate and a master's student at Utrecht. Um, subsequently, uh, she got a PhD uh, in the United States uh, in uh, uh, the University of uh, California at San Diego. And that move to the United States in, uh, starts or indicates the beginning of a very internationally oriented career that took her around the world. Uh, she was 
uh, eventually the, uh, became a professor and chair of the department at the University of Amsterdam in media studies. Um, and eventually, uh, more recently, she has been a member of the Royal, of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and was elected president of the academy in 2015. So um, in addition to those uh, uh, posts and, and uh, academic positions, she's, as I said, traveled uh, widely around the world in guest professorships uh, in universities in Canada, the United States, Australia, and um, has done research in a variety of areas that are appropriate for this, uh, this series, including uh, digital culture, social media, uh, the popularization of science and medicine, television and culture, just a wide range of activities. Her previously, one of her most recent books, among her many papers and books, is entitled The Culture of Connectivity, A Critical History of Social Media, which was published in 2015, uh, 2013, and she has upcoming a new book called The Platform Society, and I think we're going to be hearing some of her thoughts coming out of that uh, today. So um, all of these, uh, this work, the scholarly work and the administrative work, make her ideal not only for this talk, but also uh, for her participation this morning in a fascinating seminar about the initiative that we have here in Malmo University on the Data Society. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, Professor Van Dyke has to say on her topic of reflections on responsible digital societies. So please join me in welcoming her now. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. I'm arm. <laughs> so I'm like a puppet that you have to, you know, you have to turn my button in order to turn me on. Now it's very hard to turn me off. I I promise that. So, well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Tapio. Thank you, Catherine. It was a most warm welcome that I received here yesterday. And we've, I've been involved in fascinating discussions over the past two days. So thank you very much for you know welcoming and inviting me. It's a true honor to be here. And walking around in Malmö really gives me you know a great feeling of this is where it's happening. I heard you're the second city in terms of um, uh, digital activities and you know new platforms, new interactive industries and creative industries being set up. So thank you. I'm going to reflect with you on the digital society. Can you hear me okay? I feel a little, there's a little echo in my ear. But this is better, I think. Okay, that's better. So um, I would like to share with you some of my latest work indeed. Uh, Jay already introduced, this is the book from 2013 which I wrote at the beginning of the social media uh, hype, I should say. Uh, you know, there was quite a bit of platform euphoria at that time. And I was one of the first, I think, that sort of posed a few critical questions to that history. Uh, so I finished that book in 2012. But meanwhile, in the past, over the past five years, I think we've seen a tremendous change in how we regard platforms. And so last over the past year and a half or two years, I wrote this book and it will come out in August, so it will also be published by Oxford, called The Platform Society on Public Values in a Connective World. Now, I will do take some of that work, wh which has been done by m myself and my colleagues, but I will, you know, sort of weave this into, weave this into uh, some thoughts about reflections about that uh, platform society and how, why we need responsible digital societies in Europe. Now, tech companies, you know, have been in the news fairly unfavorably since, I would say, 2015. And this uh, uh, article on the right was uh, in the, the Economist last month. It talked about a tech lash against, you know, the big five, Facebook, uh, Google, Amazon, etc. And then, of course, you know, you all know we've been involved or we've been encountered a number of scandals over the, the past few years. We've had the Cambridge Analytica Facebook privacy scandal. We have been discussing fake news as, you know, uh, in a new way, um, Google's commissioner, EU commissioner for antitrust, has fined Google 2.6 billion dollars in fines over the you know last summer. So it goes on and on. Pretty much every day when I look up the newspaper, when I look into especially the New York Times, we find more and more sort of 
critical thoughts, critical reflections on what these companies do, but especially on how we should provide alternatives for, for instance, platforms. And that is something I would like to reflect on with you today. So my talk will be sort of split up in five parts. I will guide you through these reflections. And um, basically, you know, I will start with platform ecosystems, which I think they're enormously important, but you need to see the big picture before you can sort of zoom in on what plat platforms are and what they do. I will talk a little bit about platform mechanisms, about public values, that's you know the main part of my talk, and about responsibility, who are the responsible actors in this society. Um, I think the, com the implications of what I call platformization and digitalization on society are really profound. We have just begun to really start thinking about what they mean for the fabric of our societies, for how these systems are, sh are shaping you know, the very norms and values by which we live, the very structures, the, the way that our societies are organized and structures. So in these five steps, I will guide you through you know, what I call the complex system of the platform society. And then we will have a discussion afterwards on uh, what di those kind of critical questions should be that we could ask to this society. Starting with this, the global online world is pretty much dominated by states and by companies. So, and this is how I envision what you know a, ver a, a, a digital world would look like on a map. There's pretty much two platform ecosystems that dominate that world. There's an American and a Chinese ecosystem. And we'll start with the latter, but I will concentrate this talk on the first. China has its own ecosystems, uh, ecosystem. It's pretty much confined. And it's controlled, of course, by the state, but it's operated by five big companies. You may not know all of them, but there are these big five companies. There's Alibaba, which is pretty much the Chinese Amazon. There's Tencent, huge company. It operates WeChat. Perhaps you've heard of that sort of Facebook. Uh, there's Baidu, there's Jingodo Mall, and Didi. Didi is pretty much the Chinese Uber. So, um, Alibaba and Tencent, the, the two listed above, are the biggest one. They're becoming, you know, as we speak, they're becoming extremely powerful in the Chinese context, in that ecosystem, because they're branching out, you know, their core business, of course, was like with the American system in social media, communication channels, but they're now branching out in pretty much every sector in society. So they have become gatekeepers to the entire economy of China, and that is something we really need to watch. So they're wielding power not only over uh, private enterprises, like, you know, brick and mortar enterprises, like, but also, for instance, uh, Tencent and Baidu have a big pay systems and communication channels. They have bought up grocery scores, stores, uh, pharma pharmaceutical, you know, pharmacy change, etc., etc. So they're becoming very big in pretty much every sector of society. Now, in China, I won't talk much about the Chinese system, but one thing you need to remember is that in China, the state has strict power over those companies. And their sheer size, the size of these companies, makes, the, makes it easier for authorities to control these platforms, right? So in China, it's, it's really state-controlled, but the companies have, uh, you know, can be controlled by the state pretty easily. And it's a very contained system. Now, I'll skip the, Ameri the Chinese system and go to the American system because that's what I will concentrate on for this talk. I could talk for hours about the Chinese system and how similar it is to the American system, but I won't go into that today. Of course, you all know, you know this American platform e ecosystem, and that's, of course, dominated by the big five tech companies. The big five or the frightful five, whatever name you give it. Uh, Apple, Google, uh, Alphabet, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple and Microsoft. Now, they pretty much, this, this ecosystem of platforms pretty much dominates the rest of the world. Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America. Um, of course, Amer over the past years, you have probably noticed that American tech companies have tried to enter the Chinese ecosystem, right? There's been plenty in the news about Google trying to, uh, uh, you know, to go into the, um, the Chinese ecosystem, and, but... Uh, 
most of the companies, especially Facebook and most recently Uber, have been barred to enter that Chinese ecosystem. Um, they were pretty much discouraged by uh, censoring laws, by uh, you know, situations where they could not, not do what they wanted. So they have pretty much all left the Chinese market or they have bought some shares into Chinese companies so they can collaborate with Chinese companies, but then they're under the control of these Chinese companies. Then squeezed in between the US and China, we have Europe, the European continent, which has no sort of major technology companies. Here you see some figures, but the corporate headquarters of the largest players in terms of market capitalization are, very sp are spread very uneven, evenly geographically. So 47% of them are located in Asia, 36% in North America, and only 15% in Europe. And you in Sweden are actually quite lucky. We are very proud of you in Europe because you have the only a big tech company in the top 50 of the world's, the global most import, you know, most capital in terms of capital intensive uh, uh, size uh, company. And that of course is Spotify. So it's, I think it's number 48 or 49 on that, in that top 50, but we're still very proud of that. But that's the only one, uh, you know, there's, very few major comp tech companies in Europe that are, have their headquarters here and that are basically European. The Netherlands actually has just got its second unicorn. Etienne is a pay service that just made it to a unicorn last month. But, you know, we're very poor in that respect. So, what does that mean? Europe has become largely dependent on the American platform ecosystem. Now, this shouldn't be a problem. Of course, we are dependent on many, you know, global companies that we do not have represented in Europe. But in this, you know, in this case, it's not a trivial issue. So, and I will come to that in a minute. But we need, really need to think what European societies want from these technologies that are, that we import and that are actually infiltrating many of our societal systems that we can no longer do without. So that is really the question that I would like to raise here. Now, we often hear from CEOs, especially uh, Silicon Valley CEOs, that Europe is cracking down on American big tech out of jealousy. We're just completely jealous of America and that's why we're putting up putting up uh, regulatory barriers. That's why we put in you know regulatory frameworks that American tech companies do not like or do not want. So we're simply jealous. Peter Thiel is one of these people who have been uh, uh, buzzing that around. Now, I happen to take a different view. I think that European societies mostly favor what we call a Rhineland model of governing uh, economic and democratic welfare states. All of our states are pretty much organized from a different model where um, uh, the public sector, where public place, space plays a very important role. And that, of course, has been like that for ages, for centuries. But the American platform ecosystem hardly allows to carve out public space. That is not something that we find in, uh, to be part of that platform system. So what does that mean? Uh, what that means is that public values and the common good are not part of the American ecosystem's architecture. And that poses, of course, big dilemmas for how we organize our societies if we become dependent on a an, an digital infrastructure that is not made in Europe, is not controlled by you know, our states or by our citizens, and that, can, it, that is very hard to change and to impact, to influence from, from a European perspective. So basically, my main, the main question of the book that we've been uh, uh, writing over the past year is, how can European societies guard public values and the common good in an online world? Because this is a globalized system. It's not, you know, there's no longer, in that global online world, there are hardly any boundaries in terms of where data go, where data flows. There's very few checks and balances installed in, you know, what we now have in terms of government, in terms of institutional um, uh, context. So I will explain that a little later, but first, I need to explain a little bit more about what an ecosystem is and what it does, as I promised. 
Here, of course, this is you know, the big five of the American-based platform ecosystem. And you all know these big corporate players. Uh, in fact, they form together, you know, their combined value uh, makes them the world's fifth largest economy after the US, China, Germany and Japan. So in terms of market value, they're really huge and it, that's really an important factor. But as I said, my, you know, my interest is not so much in market value, it is much more in how, you know, what kind of societal power and influence they have. So I'm not concentrating on economic value, but on public value. And of course, you have all realized that these big five increasingly act as gatekeepers to all of our social and economic activities. For instance, just to, you know, uh, mention one example, uh, Google search, this Google search engine, has more than 90% of the search market in Europe, which is astounding because it doesn't even have that sort of market share in the United States. So we've become very dependent on, you know, these systems. These big five operate, you know, here I sort of, you know, uh, filled in the blanks because the big five operate strategic, what I call, online infrastructural platforms. Now, what are infrastructural platforms? You can see them here circled around their, uh, 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 their big, the big names. Um, they are things like platforms like social networks, like web hosting, pay systems, identification systems, cloud services, you see advertising agencies, search engines, map services, app stores, retail network services, analytic services, AI divisions, etc., etc. So these are what I call infrastructural services. And societies across the globe, and especially in Europe, have become pretty much dependent on this online infrastructure for organizing all of their societal sector sectors, both public and private sectors. So. Can you read the small print underneath? Okay, because it's, you know, it's quite intricate, but you can find it online later because we're going to publish all of these pictures later when the book comes out. So, um, so it's actually quite, you know, this it sounds, it looks like very easy to sort of depict all this, but it's a lot of work to find out which services are part of which infrastructure. And of course they interact. Um, there's a, there's a huge debate going on also in the United States whether these infrastructural platforms may be defined as public utilities. You know, they've become so important in our societies. Can we treat them as public utilities? This is a big discussion, particularly, um, you know, amongst lawmakers, uh, legis um, uh, legislators, because, of course, they're private infrastructures. Uh, but actually, it is very difficult for lawmakers to define which of these platforms are indeed infrastructural, you know, providing infrastructural or utility service, uh, services and which are not. So, but this is a current hot issue in uh, uh, legislation. Now, that was the core. Here, in this picture, you will find the core in the middle. The picture is not that clear. It sort of leaves out blanks. But anyway, the blurbs. Um, around that core, what you're seeing is that around the infrastructural core of platforms, you see that the big five also operate increasingly sectoral platforms that are also increasingly interwoven with those uh, infrastructural platforms at the core. Now, for the book that we wrote, we have investigated two public sectors and two private sectors. Public sectors were education and health, and the private sectors were urban transport and news. And all of these sectors are very important for our public life, right? So that was the criterion on which we based this selection. Um, so on this map, what you're seeing in the color coding, and it's, I don't have enough time to explain all of these uh, different relationships, but what you see on this map is that we have inventoried ownership relations. You know, what are the partnership, the acquisitions, and of course, uh, you know, the big five have started in each of these sections their own platforms. Take, for instance, Google Scholar um, and Google Suit for Education. Google is penetrating the educational sector, you know, 
pretty much, you know, every month you see that it's becoming bigger and bigger. So does Facebook, by the way. Facebook is there. It has started Alt School last year, which is uh, both a physical school and a, a virtual system, a new digital system that is penetrating uh, uh, the administrative systems and uh, following systems of um, uh, primary school systems in the United States. But also look here at Google News. Of course, Facebook Instant Articles is a huge major filter for news articles right now. And they have pretty much branched out in each of these different sectors. Now, it's not just, of course, these four that they're branching into, because, you know, we haven't uh, discussed in the book finance or retail or, uh, you know, lots and lots of other sectors, but there are many more. Um, what you s also see in this picture, and there's just so many things you can do in one visualization, but uh, for instance, we have color coded it that the Washington Post here was bought up by Amazon. So you see partnerships, you see uh, acquisitions. Um, of course, you know, what you don't see, because we don't have that sector, is Amazon also bought up Whole Foods. Um, and, you know, there's uh, Google, for instance, has a big stake in uh, Google. Well, Google Fit is its own platform, but in 23andMe, which is owned and operated by the ex-wife of Sergei Brin. But, you know, so there's all kinds of relationship in terms of how these political economy lines work between these uh, various sectors. Um, what you do not see in this picture is what goes underneath. You know, um, you see in terms of ownership, you see, of course, the obvious relation. Uber has started Uber Eats. Google has, of course, Google Shopping and is branching out in each of these sectors. But what you do not see in the picture is a lot of, for instance, data sharing deals. You know, uh, we, we are now seeing that, and this comes out as sort of a scandal. Hey, Facebook sold, uh, you know, our data to 60 private, uh, 60 devices. Well, of course, Facebook has sold our data to 60, you know, uh, any of or more devices. That shouldn't be come as a surprise. That it did means that we didn't see what is, you know, underwater of these systems. And that's because our laws and legislation do not account for things like data flows, for, uh, um, for, for algorithmic lock-ins. So there are a lot of mechanisms underneath that systems system that we do not see, that we do not recognize. And that is something that we need to become more aware of because that's, uh, you know, now happening out of sight of legislators, but also out of sight of citizens. And what is most intriguing about all these lines is, of course, that power in this system is exercised not so much between, inf well, of course, between infrastructures and sectors, but that is you know, easy to detect, like Google also owns Google Shopping, of course. So that's what antitrust law focuses on. But where the real power lies is across these sectors. The combination, the potential combination of data from health, for instance, with data from transportation or education in order to allow predictive analytics to work. So what we do not see and what is symbolically, uh, you know, visualized here in terms of those uh, uh, lines, that is something that we really need to understand. You know, the endless potential of combining databases and algorithmic knowledge. That is what, you know, we should be interested in. But that's very hard to get to, right? So let me talk, let me zoom in a little bit more on those platform mechanisms. That's what I call, we spent a chapter in the book talking about what are platform mechanisms that we do not see, that are pretty much invisible, and that we're only now coming to realize that are very powerful mechanisms to organize our society. So we need to look into that. The built-in mechanisms that steer all of our online traffic. And we have come to identify three different categories of these mechanisms. First is datafication, the second commodification, and the third one is selection. Now, there's a number of these mechanisms that we've sort of uh, categorized under these three big uh, 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 names. Um, all of these are pretty much hidden from view for users and regulators. And so it's very important to identify, to, to indict, identify them, and, uh, but that's not really easy. So let me just quickly help you through what datafication really is. 
datafication, we're using the term, you know, very, you know, com uh, commonplace right now, but it is, of course, the algorithmic governance of data flows. Data are generated by users, they're processed by hardware and software analytics, but oftentimes we don't even know, and we cannot, we can ask, but we don't know where they come from, who controls them, who controls data flows. Um, you know, that Facebook example, Facebook is sharing our data with 60 different device makers and Cambridge Analytica, but we didn't know. That's because those flows, those data flows, where they come from and where they go, are not made, you know, known to us, you know, so they're underwater. Algorithmic governance is um, very, very important. You know, we have increasingly, we are dealing with real-time and predictive analytic systems that define social outcomes. For instance, learning analytics that we learn, you know, learning platforms uh, in education, they're increasingly predicting what children need in terms of educational need, but they're also monitoring a lot of behavioral things. And uh, so the combination of all of these things, you know, results in algorithmic knowledge that we don't get a handle on because it's not known to us what it does to children in terms of what they learn and what they, how they're impacted by, you know, several combinations of uh, algorithmic steering. So what are the consequences? What are the implications? Those are the kind of questions that we need to ask, but that's very hard to ask when you don't even know what's happening underneath, what is happening underwater. Same holds for commodification. Of course, we know that we're all basically pushed and pulled by the business models of online platforms, but how do they work? You know, commodification basically simply means creating online value out of data flows. But in the online world, there are, not, there are four types of currency, not just one, not just money. We have four types of currency and there's data, users, attention, and money. And those four currencies are turned into what we call multi-sided markets. Now, platforms, how do they produce value? You know, we talk about business models, but oftentimes we do not exactly know how a business model creates value. Out of what? Out of which of these resources? So, you know, very roughly, basically, they do this by unbundling and connecting. First, for instance, let's take the news, Facebook's news feed. What does it do? It unbundles the product, which is a newspaper or a news site. It takes it apart in articles, which is the unbundling practice. And then what news feed does is it puts it back together for each and all of you individually. So it's personalized connective service that puts together, that connects content with advertiser services and um, uh, uh, and of course, you know, advertisers' content and, um, and your interest. So all the kind of information that producing by a user using this particular platform is information is turned into data points. And the more data points that we have, the more these platforms can connect. So that is how they are making money out of uh, information. Now, most of these business platforms are totally intransparent. You know, if you're looking at most of the platforms that you use, you hardly have any idea how they make their money. Sometimes from advertisement, but a lot of these data deals that you know you don't know and or you're not aware of. And that is something that is, you know, needs to be looked into because we ha have for you know I think 90% we have no clue as to how they actually work. Selection me mechanisms very briefly. Um, Personalization, rankings, trending topics, reputation mechanisms. Um, they're all kind of algorithmic uh, governance systems that govern us more than we can influence these algorithms. So personalization pretty much means that whatever you click, you get more of that, more of the same. So if you click on fake news, you get more fake news. If you click on sports, you get more sports. But personalization uh, algorithms, of course, are very hard to get into to you know get behind that uh, uh, that mechanism um, now all of these platform mechanisms are based on commercial values right so most of them are pushed and pulled by commercial values and they're built into the architecture of these platforms and as I said they're often you know intransparent 
My question to these platforms is, what about public values? What about the common good? How are they anchored into this system? And I often ask, you know, people who are using and also creating platforms and algorithms, where can I find public values built into this architecture? And that's a very hard question, but first you need to ask yourself, what exactly do you mean by public values? What are the kind of values that we want to build into this architectural design of our online digital society? Of course, you know, we want to inject very basic public values, more or less consumer values. That's, you know, about security. We want our, we want our um, digital connection to be secure. We want transparency. We want accuracy. If you use a health app like a Fitbit or whatever, you want it to be accurate. So that's a basic value. And of course, you want privacy. Now, a lot of the, you know, public value discuss discussions are mostly about privacy. But I think that's a limited discussion. I just love that the recent GDPR and its implementation has raised a lot of issues about privacy. I thought that was very worthwhile. At least people started to think about, uh, you know, the exercise that you had to do. Like, oh, at least you know that you're recorded now and you can have a choice whether you want to sit in that row or here or whether you want to be filmed. That, you know, is part of the effect of the GDPR, I think, that we're making things more visible. But I think, you know, values, public values, is about a lot more than just these four, and especially a lot more than privacy. These, of course, are not fixed values. You cannot buy a set of values off the shelf in the store and you just implement them in a platform. That's way too simple. What happens is that public values are constantly negotiated at every level, at the state level, the local level, you know, local municipalities, they're, they're constantly negotiating like, okay, what do we protect? Do we protect privacy or do we want more security? So they're weighing one value against another. That's, that's what democracy is really about. It's about negotiation of public values. And oftentimes these values sit in tension with each other. You know, security and transparency are often competing values. So you really need to flesh out in discussions what these values do to your society. As if this were not complicated enough, of course, there's a lot more values than just these four. You know, beyond these internet values, we want public values to pertain to society as a whole. So we want, if our digital society is fully fleshed out, we want it to be fair. We want it to be inclusive. We want us to be responsible, accountable, and especially we want to have democratic control. Now, Historically, traditionally, all of these values are, you know, negotiated and anchored, and that negotiation is anchored in our public institutions. Within schools, within local governments, within hospitals, we have systems in place, institutionalized systems, where we're used to negotiating these values. You know, a hospital board uh, decides or weighs privacy against security, and does all of these things within an institutional context. However, um, you know, many of these institutional contexts where values are weighed are currently bypassed or uh, circumvened by platforms. And take, for instance, a lot of these uh, health platforms where, you know, you give away your data and you're promised in return a, an app that, you know, may uh, identify some, some of your health data and um, uh, diagnostic apps, for instance. If you, you know, you expect from an app like that that it's accurate, but many of these apps are not, uh, were not put on the market by a hospital context. So they're made and, tr and, and, and traded outside of the context of those institutional, um, uh, institutional anchors. So basically, you know, we have to ask ourselves, where do we anchor public values and the negotiations of those values if our, all of our institutions are increasingly bypassed by platforms. So that, of course, raises the questions of responsibility. And responsibility, of course, is, you know, very basic in a fair and democratic platform society. Now, who are responsible actors or who are the actors in a society, in a digital society that organize these negotiations. And 
especially an, a platform ecosystem that is so dominated by commercial tech firms. This question of responsibility really has become a big thing over the past three years. Before, I think, 20. 14, no one ever talked about responsibility and, you know, the, uh, the especially the responsibility of um, uh, commercial platforms in this system. Here, for instance, Uber, and this is, I think, uh, 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 it's from 2015, oh no, this is 2017, even in 2017, Uber said, hey, we're not a tech company, we are a tech company, we're not a taxi service, we're connecting driver, that's the only thing we do, we're connecting drivers to users. So we're not a sectoral uh, company, you know, all of our, or the organization of our society is pretty much in sectors that are regulated. We're not part of that. We're bypassing these sectors and we're a tech company. So as connectors, they say, we're not subject to transport regulation. Now, there's a lot at stake in this question, whether Uber should be considered a taxi or a taxi service, or a tech company. Um, that, of course, has to do with whether it has to abide to sectoral rules, whether it has to abide to rules with licenses, with employee status, paying for pensions, insurances, liability laws, etc. That all of those all apply to a particular sector. But if Uber says, hey, we're not a sectoral player, we're simply a platform, you know, we're a tech company. This actually, this question went all the way up to the European Court, and as some of you may know, in December, just recently, five months ago, European Court ruled, yes, Uber is a taxi company. So now, you know, this is one of these struggles, one of these negotiation moments, defining moments in what exactly do these companies do? What exactly are, uh, is the status of digital platforms? This was one such defining moment. Same thing happened with uh, Facebook, of course. This was in November 2016, just after the US elections. And Facebook came under fire, of course, for creating filter bubbles and spreading the spreading of fake news. So Mark Zuckerberg here said, hey, you know, when he was a reproach that he had a part in that in, uh, in the fake news, Facebook is not a media company. We do not produce news. The only thing what we do is we unbundle the newspaper, you know, we take articles and then we rebundle it, we reconnect it. The only thing we do is connecting readers to content to advertisers. We're a tech company, we're not a news company. So that is some sort of withdrawal from sectoral responsibility, which is part of our physical society, but not of a digital society that is emerging with a new infrastructure. So that is finding new anchors. Um, this, of course, was 2016. In 2017, we saw a big backlash against uh, uh, Facebook for not accepting responsibility for its content. And in the United States, more than 50% of news content is distributed through Facebook. So if the biggest distributor says we withdraw from responsibility is just what, you know, what we connect, that's a huge thing. You know, that changes the, the structure, if not the fabric of our societal organization. Well, you probably know the story. In 2017, Facebook and Google and YouTube, they started to acknowledge that they need to be more responsible. They need to take more responsibility for that new digital society. And, but that, they just, that, doesn't, that didn't come up just you know, out of the blue. Of course, this was after a lot of pressure from not just from users, but also from whistleblowers, the, Facebook, the Cambridge Analytica scandal from lawmakers, but especially the pressure from advertisers. You know, Procter & Gamble, for instance, said, hey, Facebook, we've had enough of this. You know, we don't want to advertise next to hate speech or fake news. That's not what we want from you. So that pressure, you know, built up, and finally he, you know, started to take, uh, Mark Zuckerberg started to take some responsibility for fake news. And that ended up, you know, last month in the congressional hearings where Mark Zuckerberg was forced to take responsibility, more or less. Uh, unfortunately, he faced senators who, I think, barely knew what kind of questions to ask, simply because they didn't have the technical understanding of how Facebook worked. I thought it was pretty embarrassing. Well, and then he came over to Brussels, facing a European, you know, or European set of politicians and, uh, and lawmakers, and that was 
probably even more of a farce because they weren't even allowed to ask specific, well, they could ask specific questions, but they didn't give him much time to answer. So the question really is here is not just about carrying responsibility, but the million dollar question is who has rule setting power? Who are, you know, are these companies going to have rule setting power of the digital in the digital society and who carries that responsibility? So I think that was really behind this, uh, uh, these hearings, for instance. Talking about responsibility, if we look at a society, and you probably, you know, this is something from a very basic governance 101 course, but who are the actors in society that can carry responsibility and how do they do that? Um, there's three types of actors in a digital society, like there is in, in a physical society, market, state, and civil society. In Europe, ideally, you know, that's sort of the Western European model, the, the Rhineland model that I just talked about. There's a balanced approach involving both markets and state and civil society actors that combine their interest in multi-stakeholder organizations. Now, that of course holds for pretty much you know, all of the Europe, especially here in Sweden, but also in Holland, that's how we usually go about governing, right? We try to collaborate with all of these different market state and civil society actors. But all of these actors do not have the same interests and they should be distinguished as different actors. You know, public actors do not have the same interests as market actors. And there's a tendency sometimes to just put them together and they all do you know, the same thing and we all go for the same interest. That, I think, is not what I mean by a multi-stakeholder organization. There should be distinct, you know, distinct different uh, interests, but you can still collaborate. Now, let me give you an example of how you can work on a wicked problem in a digital society and see what all of these actors can do to solve that or to at least remedy the problem that you know, I just pointed out. Um, and let me take the problem of fake news as an example. Of course, over the past years, we've been struggling with how to combat fake news in you know, a public sphere where we want democratic control over information. Let's start with the market level. And you just saw Facebook. They were really you know, unhappy about what happened in, uh, during the elections and afterwards. Um, but in response to that mounting criticism, especially from advertisers, Facebook took several actions. Uh, for instance, they asked news, legacy news organizations to flag fake news. And many of these news organizations refused. They said, well, hey, first, you know, you disrupt our business model. Uh, we provide the news and now you're asking us to do the flagging. You know, what, what the heck? Um, they also asked users, Facebook started to ask users, that's what you see here, to rank the credibility of news. So they're tr pretty much trying to outsource the 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 uh, selection mechanisms to users. And of course, they hired 3,000 extra editors to train algorithms. So at least, I think that was the good thing. Facebook acknowledged that they had to take some responsibility. And I've had discussions with you know Facebook executives about this. Um, but on the other hand, they refused to give audiences, users, access to their criteria of selection. You remember the mechanisms? They're still hidden from you to users. You cannot get a finger on what actually the selection criteria are that Facebook news feed is um, uh, 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 using. So this really poses a dilemma. And this is just one, uh, I'll pose you know, more of that sort of dilemma, but do we want Facebook and its users to be the designated editors of news? You know, that's a real question. Is that part of the democratic society that we envision as, you know, a right and an, uh, a, a fair democratic society? Now let's go to the state level. Here's a state actor. In Germany, of course, in response to that fake news problem, Germany presented a draft law that was going to impose very tough legal sanctions on you know, online companies distributing fake news and hate speech, by the way, so, you know, in the same law. Um, so, from now on, hate speech and fake news should be taken down after, you know, should be taken down within 24 hours after posting. So, basically, like with the Uber uh, European court case, here European states are basically saying, 
You may not call yourself a news company, but you have the responsibility of news companies to do you know, this kind of, you're responsible for what you distribute. So you cannot distribute hate speech and fake news. This actually compiles the dilemma because do we actually want states to censor news or do we want them to prevent the selection or do we want them to uh, influence the selection of news? Do we make them, plat plat do we make them to help platform censor themselves? I don't think so. This, this compounds the dilemma, but it gets even more complicated. Civil society, civil society actors, you know, were very active in the fake news problem and they took actions. I have found three examples, organizations like Meden, for instance, that's a consortium of uh, designers, journalists, companies and civilians, and they started to develop uh, uh, news checking tools, right? So that's what they did. Gradually they became supported by Google, and now they're sort of, uh, you know, sort of incorporated in the Google uh, system to help them ma uh, make a selection. Uh, Corrective is a German nonprofit. It started as a nonprofit and it has now started uh, to work for Facebook. So basically, the nonprofits are, you know, they became funded by the, some of the big five and they became part of that system. Wiki Tribune, I have to say, is a, a very promising initiative. It's a nonprofit uh, platform started by Jimmy Wales and uh, they started to develop tools for checking true and false news. So that is also an interesting initiative. Now, talking about dilemmas, um, you know, this is really important because civil society organizations are supposed to be independent. If they start, you know, to become funded or supported by some of the big news, uh, big uh, tech companies, what happens to their independence? So that's compounding to the dilemma. You know, I'm just, I'm not solving your problem of fake news, I'm just compounding to the dilemma here. Citizens, you know, part of the civil society have their own responsibility. You and I, you know, we can protest fake news, but we are the ones clicking, you know, clicking on fake news so it, uh, it's, it's still part of our daily life. Citizens, of course, are consumers and they are heavily invested in using these platforms. So there's another, you know, big dilemma. They're constantly trading private information for uh, uh, convenience and for, in uh, for getting a free information. But the dilemma is, can you really make citizens responsible for disinformation and fake news? Well, that's quite something because, for instance, in uh, you know this is an, was an experiment in the United States. Sixty percent of U.S. users does not recognize, does not cannot tell the difference between a sponsored story and a news story in their uh, in their newsfeed. So, can you make those citizens responsible for the identification of fake news? Well, that's really you know a big thing. So. I've made the wicked problem even more wicked because it is such multifaceted and you'd need all of these actors in society, in a digital society, to become responsible actors towards solving that fake news problem. And I don't think we can solve that overnight, but we do need the awareness of, you know, how do we go about that uh, in our society. Recently, the European uh, com uh, Commission um, commissioned a, a European high-level group and they published a recommendation just last month or six weeks ago. And what they do is they really advocate, you should look it up and read it, it's very interesting, and they really f are in favor of taking that multi-dimensional approach to fake news, you know, where states and companies and civil society actors are invited to work together to collaborate on finding a solution. This is very European, I think. So whether it will yield a solution in the long run, I do not know. This is just all just very recent. So this information of fake news was just an example. I think we're faced with enormous challenges in terms of how we should go about governing the digital society. And this holds for, you know, all of the sectors that I showed and many more beyond. Think about finance and Bitcoin that is going to, you know, change that sector hugely. But think about health and how that is changing our the way that we're handling digital information. Um, so let's talk a little bit finally about the complex challenges that we are currently facing. Um, 
I think there are many, and I, you know, I can't just in a few minutes explain what those complex challenges are that we are facing. But um, it's really about more than just a transformation from a more or less physical towards a digital uh, society. It is how to combine those two and still sort of rely, be rely, be able to rely and trust our frameworks, the frameworks that we have set in place to rule our and govern our society. So this is really about how to reorganize societies in, you know, in education, in transport, in finance, in health, and then also in, you know, the combination of these sectors towards, you know, more of an equal power balance. I think that European countries are really in the middle of this transformation and they are jointly, we are all jointly responsible for what comes out. And that's why I think the, uh, the project that you're doing here at Malmo University is so important. We're, we're looking and searching for um, collaboration between different projects and different fields where we see that we have a responsibility in how to govern these various, you know, digital challenges. So to come back to my initial question, you know, that, you know, that main question of how we can secure public values and the, pub, uh, and the common good in an online Europe. Well, that's not easy because on the one hand, we have this American corporate ecosystem where a lot of commercial values or pretty much all commercial values are inscribed in its architecture. And meanwhile, in Europe, we rely on that architecture that is partly underwater, that we do not see, that's invisible to us, in order to organize our society and to govern our society. So that is a real big um, uh, question. So how can we govern the public good and uh, the common good and public values in that sort of society? Well, let me just give you a few suggestions. Let me finish with that. But First of all, I think we need to take a comprehensive approach to the digital society. Meaning that all of us, you know, still are very much looking for... We can't really get a handle on where to start. We were t discussing projects this morning in uh, health, in uh, yesterday in education, in transport, in culture, where we were all grappling, trying to grapple with the same questions. What do, you know, where do data flows come from? Where do they go? How can they be combined? What is a responsible way of um, uh, these, of governing these data flows? Where do we ask, where do we pose questions to algorithmic decisions that are pretty much made for us by technology that we cannot access, you know, that we don't, do not have access to. There's so many questions that we ask in all of these different fields that we have to combine those forces and take a comprehensive approach to what do, what kind of society do we want to live in? How do we want to organize those values? What should they all, uh, you know, what should they lead into? And how do we reflect on what they need to do for us and how they change us, how they change our practices? So, Listening to you know all of your groups this morning and yesterday, I think that uh, this is exactly this. It's not just that we can't collaborate at a university, but this is exactly reflecting what we're seeing in society today. We have all these different sectors where we see similar um, uh, similar developments in terms of adjusting to a situation, a world where tech companies operate globally, operate you know without being. Uh, secured and controlled by governance that have actually, you know, organized them themselves. So we're all grappling with this, with similar questions, but we can't quite get a handle on where the overall questions in these systems lie. And that I think you see the same in government. You know, in the Netherlands, for instance, you have um, uh, different departments. You know, that work on digitalization of. Uh, transport, smart cities, digital health, education, and they're all looking into it from their very disciplinary perspective. The thing is that we're, you know, we have to look at beyond those disciplinary perspectives and beyond those uh, sectoral interests to look at what's happening at the ecosystem level and at the global level of uh, those data flows. So that sort of approach, that comprehensive approach is really very difficult, but it's very necessary. Um, we also need to help articulate a value-centric policy. 
not just for each sector, but well, for each sector, but particularly for the public sector. Because only fairly recently, over the past few years, we have come to realize that the, the ecosystem that we are, have become dependent upon is based on such different values than the public values that we would like to see reflected in this system. So it's very important to articulate that. Which public values do we actually stand to protect? And it's not very easy, but at the local level, at the national level, at the supranational level, you know, the, the Uber court case at the European court, it basically said, you know, what are our public values? If we consider this a, uh, a sector, then it has to abide to all our collective rules, you know, like paying taxes, like, uh, you know, a lot of collective services, and otherwise our society will dysfunction. We'll see the same sort of negotiations in every sector. And just to give you an example of a local negotiation, I think they are very instructive. This is an example from Sao Paulo, not exactly from Europe, uh, but I think it's inst instructive. Uber, this was a few years ago, when Uber was entering Sao Paulo, which forced the city to think about, you know, what is happening? Do we allow Uber? We have our own taxi services. We have public transport. So they were taking a comprehensive approach to urban transport, not just looking at taxi services in particular, but overall public urban or overall urban transport. And then they articulated the city's problem towards you know what's happening in urban transport and they said you know there, we have a few problems to deal with we have too much traffic in the downtown area um, Sao Paulo had too many taxes they had unemployment and especially unemployment among amongst women they had very poor accessibility in some city areas so there were a number of problems with urban transport in general there was pollution of course so there were many many problems and then they took back a step and said, instead of just licensing or trying to license Uber as a taxi service, we're going to look at that comprehensive system as a system. And they tried first to articulate the values that they wanted to solve, and then they came up with a licensing system where you had to buy, as a transporter, public or private, you had to buy credits per transportation mile. Now, this is just a local city system. And um, so each of these credits can be priced dynamically, so the city can decide to subsidize certain transport miles. For instance, it, they become cheaper when you go to underserved areas. Um, you could, for instance, serve handicapped passengers and, and get a discount on your, uh, on your credits. Um, they uh, allocated a 15% uh, minimum for female drivers to solve the unemploy uh, unemployment problem. So for each of the problems that they defined for, you know, uh, electric cars, they would get a discount. So they first defined each of their city problems, the urban problems, and then they came up with a system that priced all of these credits dynamically so it would help to solve problems. Now that is what I mean by a, this is a local example, but it's a comprehensive approach to an entire sector rather than, you know, starting to just you know, a license Uber, for instance. And then, of course, you have one platform and then there's many others. So that's what I mean by uh, articulating public values and then taking a comprehensive approach. This is just, you know, one example. Another suggestion I would have is, and this is very serious, is to, we, especially in Europe, we need to update regulatory frameworks. Um, currently, lawmakers, I, real, I just realized that you don't have a law school in this, at this university, but it's, you know, I work with a lot of, you know, legal scholars and they were working with tech people, so uh, privacy by design is quite a big thing, but um, we really need to update regulatory frameworks because I think lawmakers are currently missing the right vocabulary to capture technical changes. This is really a big thing, you know. Things like data flows and how to uh, how they create path dependency, algorithmic lock-in, all of these are new sort of uh, technically based um, uh, terms, technically technically based concepts that we have not covered in our law, not covered in our legal system. So last summer, when Margrethe Vestager, uh, the EU Commissioner for Antitrust, she fined Google 2.6 billion in antitrust fines, and that was for uh, you probably remember this, and that was for 
uh, the combination antitrust Google Search, which was an infrastructural core platform, and Google Shopping. Now, Google Shopping is just a tiny little thing in that whole ecosystem. The, you know, the underlying I, uh, uh, interests, of course, are much, much bigger than just Google Shopping. That's really tiny. Uh, compared to what Amazon does, it's really nothing. So if we're going to find each and every you know, small part of that system, we're, have, we're going a long way, right? So that will not really, that's not a drop in the bucket which you know, will uh, change that whole system. So we need to think about the system itself and how we regulate it. So we need to really redefine what sort of concepts we uh, use for regulatory mechanisms. Um, another thing is that in terms of regulation, and as we saw, uh, as I looked at the con congressional hearings, I realized that a lot of politicians and regulators do not have the slightest clue as to how these system works and how they are interoperable. And that, of course, is a type of knowledge that we see less and less in the public sector. You know, we no longer have the knowledge to keep up with the technical ingenuity of the platforms that define how our interactions and how our lives are coming together. So that, I think, is a very important thing. Um, we need to stimulate the development and operation of non-profit and public platforms. And that is because the ecosystem as it is now, that infrastructure, has no public space. You know, in, um, and in order to prevent that a lot of important tasks, public ca tasks, have to be outsourced to private uh, corporations, you really need to invest in public expertise and in public sectors. So that, I think, you know, I really want to argue for um, the, the combined expertise of the public sector. There's a few examples, and we talked about education yesterday, and um, Open Up Ed and Federica are public platforms in the area of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. There, of course, there's many uh, corporate uh, providers of MOOCs, like Coursera, like edX, which is, by the way, a nonprofit. Um, but there's hardly any public platforms. So I really encourage, I'm really glad that there's some European initiatives that are providing public space in this specific area. Um, finally, and this is something that we have been discussing over the past few uh, days, and that I think is where it's become, becoming really exciting. I think we're, when we talk about implementing public values in the digital society, it really requires an interdisciplinary effort. And that is what we as academics, I just say we and academics, as if all of you here are academics, I just assume that, but that's of course not true. Um, but, you know, over the past few years, what I've seen in academia is that where everyone tends to withdraw in its own disciplinary corner and uh, just use its his or her own methodologies that they're simply used to. Now, over the past three years, what I've seen is very encouraging that people start talking to each other. The engineers in my universities are now starting to talk to the legal scholars because they're very interested in privacy by design. You know, how do you do that? How do you incorporate um, uh, privacy notions into the design of your uh, of your platform or of your technology? And Political scientists are started to talk to sociologists, to legal scholars and media scholars. I think that is very encouraging and that's exactly what we need. We can no longer withdraw into our own balloons or our own little filter bubbles in academia where you can just do what you've done for ages. This is a time where we need to come together and actually negotiate you know, those public values but also those disciplinary approaches that we've been talking about in our own filter bubbles, but now we need to come together and take a comprehensive approach to this problem as an academic problem. And not just academic, I think we also need to begin to learn how to work with society. This morning I gave an example of how at the Utrecht University we are now working with municipalities to help them to take, you know, they have, they have now encountered over the past three years loads and loads of data from different sources and they really need help in terms of deciding how to combine and you know the ethical decisions that are uh, really at, you know the groundwork for deciding which data you allow into your decision making 
And the GDPR, once again, has been a great boon in making people aware of how important that is. But we have some very you know, civil, uh, civic projects that are looking into those kind of collaborations that I think are very, very uh, promising. So, to finish, um, I really think that you know, the digital society asks us to really you know, to come together as scholars and define what sort of society we want and how we can help the world in terms of research. What can we do to contribute to this society? And, and this is you know, my last slide, but I thought it was interesting to show to you, is that in the Netherlands, we have chosen, we have selected the theme of, we have 14 universities in the Netherlands, and we have now selected the digital society or governing the digital society as a theme for all of our universities. And what we realized is that each of our universities, our 14 universities, have different expertise. Some universities have technical expertise and they're very good at data science. Others have the legal expertise that we need to uh, rearrange, you know, to understand the technologies. So we basically identify what university has which expertise and then we try to combine our big questions into the digital society. And that, in that way, we sort of pool our expertise and our research um, uh, subjects in order to bring together people who need each other in terms of developing research teams and research projects. So this happened last year and it resulted in, you know, pretty much along the lines that we discussed this morning. We identified several teams, but VS New means the Association of Dutch uh, um, Research Universities. So, um, and we pulled all this expertise into uh, a national program for which we received extra funding from the government. This was basically our proposition. If we do that, if we help you make a more responsible digital society, you need, we need to get extra funding. Academics are very good at begging for funding, of course. They usually do that on the individual level. This time, we managed to do that as a collective. And actually, you may think that is, you know, that's what academics always do, they beg for money, that's what we're very good at. In this case, I think what was so encouraging is that it wasn't about, finally, we got 500 million per year extra, which is quite a sum, I'm quite, quite proud of that. But what I found even more valuable is the process. We brought together, you know, some 1,500 researchers from the whole country, and now we have identified all of our expertise and we're actually collaborating a lot more than we used to do. And that, I think, was the most valuable part of that process. So that is how I would like to end my uh, exercise on reflecting on a responsible digital society, ending with the kind of responsibility that we as academics can carry in this uh, particular theme. So I hope this sort of appeals to you know, some of your interests, and I would like to open the floor for discussion. Well, thank you for that a fascinating uh, and multifaceted um, introduction to this very complex topic. And I know that I'm sure that uh, many of you in the audience have questions uh, or are formulating questions in your mind. I'll start by asking a couple, and then we'll open it for everybody. And I guess I'd like to start with a question that I could, or uh, ask you to elaborate on an issue that I could frame as an issue of trust or an issue of complicity, by which I mean that there seems to be a paradox that uh, on the one hand, we see in the headlines, we see uh, expressions of great concern about the way data is being captured and, and uh, commodified and taken um, by private uh, companies. And yet, on the other hand, people, the users, willingly provide this data. They're complicit in the process of data collection to a very large extent. So how do you, could you reflect on that paradox, and <laughs> what do we do about it? Yeah, I can uh, reflect on that, but I'm not sure if I can give you a, a concrete answer. I have found that, you know, the most um, baffling paradox for the past three years, people are trusting these uh, companies with their most intimate data, and at the same time, they don't trust them as companies. And that, I, you know, I don't get. 
I have never used Facebook. I've never been on Facebook. This is a confession that is now public, but you know, most people know. Uh, I've never been tempted because ever since you know I knew how Facebook wor worked, I decided not to use it. I have to do one confession though. I use WhatsApp, and I already knew that. Facebook is using those data, you know, and uh, although they were arguing that they were not giving access to WhatsApp data, but of course they do. Um, so, but I cannot understand, uh, you know, this issue of trust is very, very important. How can we trust companies, companies with our most intimate data, especially uh, knowing that they can combine all of these data into, you know, new knowledge about you? Like, you know, your health data with uh, educational data, with uh, all of your most intimate uh, private details from using, you know, whatever app. I just don't get it. But the issue of trust is extremely important. And that is, I think, the issue of trust has been central in the discussions over, you know, in, face in the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal. In, uh, now people start to realize we're not giving away our data to something that we can't trust. It is trust that is at stake in this dilemma. So part of, you know, last year was the GDPR was one of the things that made that people aware of that trust dilemma. And um, I think if you know, if you're totally against the GDPR or whatever you think of the GDPR, that sort of raising awareness has been one of the most profound um, uh, advantages of, you know, of the GDPR. Not the law itself, but uh, finally it's brought to the surface that this is an issue about trust. And do you think that those kinds of initiatives, things like the GDPR, can function as a way to educate people? I guess what I'm really asking is, uh, you know, who takes, who ultimately is going to take responsibility if we're going yeah. to change things? Be is it a question of, you mentioned academics, which are, uh, who are obviously elites, uh, when there's a, a huge, you know, mass public that continues to use these platforms, uh, how do we, how do we understand that balance of responsibility? Well, that's what I call the million dollar question. What, you know, the, the question of responsibility is really a wicked problem because there's so many actors involved yeah. and each of these actors have their own interest and they're not giving up, uh, you know, for instance, the trade between, that's why I called public values a negotiation battle. A lot of people do not want to trade, uh, well, they want to trade privacy for uh, uh, convenience, you know, that's a trade off that they make. Once they, uh, have to make a trade-off between privacy and security, that may be another matter. And um, it's very hard to tell in different states, you know, you have different trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the crowds that you're mentioning and the elites are not the same in each state. For instance, in Germany, the question of hate speech was very much of an uh, awareness trigger in Germany, not so much in Holland, which you would say that's strange because it's adjacent. In Holland, privacy is a, even a bigger thing than in Germany. So there's subtle um, uh, cultural differences between the two. In the United States, privacy, I don't think is very much of an issue. I've always experienced that privacy is a very different concept for Americans than it is for Europeans. Mm. And uh, so privacy is, you know, the GDPR I think would never work the way it would work in, as it works in Europe. So um, it is really, you know, I'm not, I put up a lot of questions really in the, uh, in the past hour, so I can't really answer. I'm struggling towards finding a solution for all of these problems. And that, that's a very interesting and important point because it raises uh, another question or related question, which is uh, because, these, uh, because the internet is international and global, yeah. because these companies are international and global, if you have competing or at least um, different senses of, the appropriate balance between privacy and convenience and security in not only in you know two countries as closely uh, I mean as close to each other physically as the Netherlands and Germany but the United States or China the China or the large yeah. you know large burge, you know future markets in Latin America and even in Africa how do you uh, how do you adjudicate that how do you come to a to a solution that yeah. will work globally well, that is a real problem. That's why I started out with showing you the two ecosystems. And if we look at the Chinese ecosystems, uh, system, there's really there are very similar mechanisms at stake there. But in China, the culture about privacy is very different. Privacy is something that where it's much more surveillance, 
and people don't feel like that's infringing upon that the state is infringing upon their basic human rights when for instance they get fined when they walk through a red light three times and that's automatically detected and then that gets subscribed subscribe uh, subtracted from their sesame credits so you know after doing that three times you're simply um, uh, you know you, you get lesser credits and that has consequences, implications for your further social life. And that is part of the Chinese cultural system. So that's a very different system, that system than we have in Europe and mostly in uh, the Netherlands. So that is why I always say that the, most, the, the core of the dilemma in the digital society is not so much economic. We've always approached it as an economic value-creating system. I think it's a cultural system. It's not that th these technologies are reflecting our values about privacy, etc. They're constructing those values. And that is simply, you know, something that we need to be more aware of. How we are constructing these values, these public and cultural values, with the systems that we are producing while we're implementing them in our daily lives. Uh, what about the question of, I'll call it the question of democracy in the digital age. Um, you talked about the case of fake news, and um, you've also talked eloquently about this question of the danger to the public space um, that is posed by these platforms. I'm wondering about the term public sphere, uh, in addition to public space, in the you know, Habermasian sense of, right. of a belief that, some, that in some way, in an ear earlier um, period of media technologies, say in the 19th century, there was a a room for kind of debate, uh, uh, the public debate that went on about major issues. Um, and uh, my question is, is this uh, public sphere being eroded uh, in, a, in, in a, an unavoidable way by th these technologies and practices? Or is, is the, can the public sphere be Saved. Protected, saved. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, the public sphere has become quite a, you know, contrived sort of a, a difficult issue to sure. um, uh, to use. That's why I stick to public space and the use of, you know, the, and, the, and the public sector. But really what was interesting in Habermas' uh, definition of the public sphere is that it was all-encompassing. You know, it had like all views can be um, uh, uttered, can be uh, outed in this public, this one public sphere. The problem is, in even if even though we think that the internet is global and is now like open to everyone, that is not the case. The filtering mechanisms that have become part of that ecosystem are subtly but very definitely um, uh, creating separate spaces for all kinds of different groups. And although we think there is one public sphere, you know, this ecosystem, everyone can access anything at any moment, that is not true. Besides there being a dark net and besides there being a Chinese uh, 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 ecosystem and operating sphere, also within the American ecosystem, there has uh, there's becoming sort of a layered system of uh, different, you know, not only the, the big platforms, but they're now fringe platforms that feel ousted from the mainstream platforms. So you see the splintering of the public mm. sphere pretty much every day. So it's very difficult to talk, to sort of go back to a traditional uh, definition of the Habermasian public sphere because that's no longer um, a concept that we can use in this context. Who would like to? Uh to join this discussion, please raise your hand. Yes, please. Uh, I think we need to get a microphone to you. I really enjoyed it. Ah. Oh, this really has an echo. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, I was uh, I was a little bit provoked by um, uh, your mention of this uh, um, self-regulating approach um, by users to fake news on on, on Facebook, um, and I wondered if that could work uh, at all, uh, precisely because of um, uh, this system that you just mentioned of these loosely con connected niches of, of knowledge or visibility. Um, and then I got reminded to the early uh, days of Wikipedia uh, when um, <laughs> the discussion was going on, if that could work. And then there was one uh, comment I remembered 
uh, a user said that it could only work in practice, but never in theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, however, in Wikipedia's case, you have that um, one, um, you could say, a, a, a pinned content that is uh, visible. Um, so the approach is radically yeah. different for users than on Facebook, where, where there are all these niches. So I'm actually quite, um, I find it dubious. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm well, not very optimistic about it. I'm wondering about your opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, you raised the dilemma that uh, Jimmy Wills raised. This was exactly his comment, looking at this various uh, civil society uh, organizations that are starting to work with, you know, detecting fake news and, uh, um, and um, uh, eliminating it. Uh, he started Wikimedia as uh, some sort of counterpart to Wikipedia and then f sp specifically for fake news, for detecting fake news. And he raised precisely this issue that you're mentioning. If you define what fake is news is and what's not, you should make that visible, who identifies it, like you do in Wikipedia. If you go behind the screen, you can identify the source of who is making the edit. So Wikipedia is very much based on, uh, of course, the uh, crowdsourcing knowledge and uh, the wisdom of the crowds, of course. But um, at the core of Wikipedia is the visibility of who edits what at what moment, and you know you can identify the source of um, uh, ed of of who's making the editing and the comments. So that's his idea of how we should approach fake news. Um, that, of course, there's another group of people who says, well, fake news can only be solved by implementing blockchain. So they're looking for uh, a technological solution to what they basically consider a technological problem. Blockchain is some, by some considered to be the sort of uh, all-encompassing overall solution to all problems ever caused in the internet age. Well, it's my opinion that you know blockchain may offer you know, very interesting solutions, but unless you have identified and articulated what the underlying problems are, you will never go to solve anything with blockchain. Um, so technology is not like this um, force that does anything by itself. And that is, I think, what really made it problematic for Facebook to find one solution to the problem of uh, um, uh, selecting what fake news is and what's not. For one thing, they're a global company and they have to f do the editing uh, uh, trick for each and every country where there's different legislators. So, and on the other hand, they're, um, you know, they're, they have to automate everything. They cannot, they hire 3,000 editors who, you know, the hum make are the human decision makers. By the way, there's a wonderful documentary out right now. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's called The Cleaners. And it's about how uh, human editors are cleaning Facebook, the ones that are hired by Facebook to do the cleaning. It's really pretty astonishing. Um, so anyway, that's a sideline. But Facebook realizes it can never handle the problem by hiring more and more and more editors. And by doing that, they're sort of acknowledging that they're a media company, right? So, and they do not want to be a media company. They do not produce news. But distributing and selecting is, of course, inherently part of a news routine. You know, most of your journalistic, uh, uh, the professional code is that, you know, is that selection and distribution mechanism. So Facebook is now in the process of, gee, you know, we need to automate this process. We need human editors, but still we cannot face this problem at such a global s scale that is so splintered when we're continuing along the same lines. So they are really grappling with this problem. And, uh, you know, that's why I pointed out that it's not just one actor that can solve this problem. They have to do that in collaboration with all these other actors without uh, actually knowing the solution myself, because, you know, this is really a huge problem. I have to look really high up to see all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, I have a question that's sort of political, or perhaps it's about the limitations of politics. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment on what you think the effects of taxation would be on these big American tech companies. Um, if you put aside the obvious benefits of funding you know, public programs, perhaps it would be um, symbolically important 
for states in Europe to assert a regulatory control over these companies. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah. It's a very diffi difficult question, and uh, I know economists are really you know, interested in this question. Um, what we're seeing is um, you know, tax evasion in many ways is a huge problem among you know, global, any global company, but it's particularly these uh, companies. Taking a responsibility is also taking the responsibility to belong to a community, and part of that belonging to a community is acknowledging that you're part of uh, you know, you're using communal resources of that community, and so you have to contribute to that uh, community. Um, there's a very huge gap between what the tech companies uh, say they do and what they actually do. For instance, when uh, um, Facebook has now said that the advertise the income they uh, generate from advertising, that they will now pay income tax or uh, uh, revenue tax in the country where the uh, ad revenue was generated. So that's one thing. At the same time, by the same means, just two weeks before the GDPR, they moved, like I think, 25% of their European-based customers, because their headquarters were in Ireland, uh, they moved that back to the United States. And of course, assuming that they would not have to comply with the GDPR, and therefore, part of that tax revenue is going also to the United States. So it's a very, you know, very complicated and double-sided issue. Taxa the evasion of taxation has been a huge, uh, big thing. And uh, of course, that's why um, they not only saying we are tech companies, they're also saying, and they're now reasserting in under the Trump administration that they're American companies. By the way, when they first the first congressional hearings, all both Apple and Google and Facebook said we're not really American companies, we're global companies. They said that explicitly when they were in courts. But over the past few months, uh, now that Trump has changed the, um, tax uh, the tax laws, both Apple and Google have brought some of their assets back from Europe and the, Ka the Cayman Islands back to the United States, where they, of course, can profit from, uh, have from this yeah. new tax uh, law. So it's incredibly complicated. I'm not, uh, you know, a, uh, an econ economist, and I'm totally not a, a scholar in, in taxes, but uh, this is really an important issue. And it's part of, I think, I consider it part of this cultural dilemma of, um, you know, are you a global company or where do you take responsibility? That is why I prefer to choose the angle of responsibility over many of these very specific angles into taxation and into uh, governance and into... Uh, so responsibility is responsibility for everything, you know, for everything that we consider to be part of making something a democratic uh, society. There's another question. Gee, I've never been lecturing in a hall like that. Okay, so I'm far away in the corner. Thomas. Uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, hi, uh, from the Department of Computer Science and uh, Media Technology. So, inspiring talk. Uh, it's not really my area, so it might be a bit uh, stupid question. But um, I was thinking, uh, yeah, so uh, these um, platforms help shaping our values uh, or influences our values. and. Uh, I was thinking, uh, and we were talking a bit about selection uh, and filtering that happens and automation. So it feels like uh, we need, and you're, you're saying that yourself, that you feel a need that we need to become more engaged in understanding those uh, selection and filtering processes. What are your, you know, you, you have such a broad overview. What are your thoughts on the possibilities of forcing uh, the companies that have these platforms to show a bit more in a transparent fashion how their selection and filtering algorithms are, are doing their job. You know, what, what are the chances to... Because I can see that, for instance, how public or open source alternatives could, could easily do this and potentially compete with the existing big players in social media, for instance, like Facebook, you know, in a couple of years, someone comes up with a Facebook that is open source, yeah. is very open about how things are filtered, you know, Facebook might get competition. 
but but you might also consider a law approach. Yeah. So you might force by law some of these companies open to open law. up and show in some way, yeah. uh, a bit more at least, what is going on. I, I don't know, what, what, what's your thoughts? Very important question. Actually, uh, I've raised the question in the book where I, you know, um, for instance, in the health sector, that's a good example where you have company, corporation, corporate platforms come in and, you know, they use public data, right? Because all the patient data are, in fact, public data if it were, was a public hospital. And the th what they do is they basically privatize the algorithmic knowledge that comes out of those, da of those data. This happened in England, for instance, the NHS hospital deal with Google uh, DeepMind. And uh, what comes out of it is a privatized, um, uh, privatized algorithmic knowledge that is cur and is that's subsequently sold to public hospitals from which they draw drew the sources in the first place. Now, your question about open source is very, very relevant. Is open source in the public domain, is that an answer to the privatized notion of uh, algorithmic knowledge and, and data uh, possession? Um, I do believe it is. The thing, the problem is that open, you know, the definition of open right now is that public sectors are making data open to everyone, but it's not reciprocal. So the reciprocity of the open definition is very, very important. And that what, you know, there what comes in here is that the negotiation about values that I talked about. For instance, each hospital is now is currently negotiating um, their exchange with, you know, Google gives them free analytics and free software in exchange for their public data about diseases and patients, health data, etc. cetera. Um, what I learned from, this was one case in the Netherlands, is that uh, someone who was very savvy in uh, uh, privacy values started to negotiate that with, uh, with Google and they got out the best deal. But many of these hospital just, uh, hospitals just give it away for free. So I think that the notion of open, we really need to reconsider what it means. Does it mean that we give away data from the public sector to for anyone who wants to use it, which is fine, as long as the knowledge that comes out of it is not subsequently privatized and monetized uh, and not given back to the public who generated those data in the first place. So I think there's a really important issue that uh, you know, we all need to face. Is this part of the deals that we're going to broker with these companies? Or is this part of a public domain that we're, uh, we're seeing is sort of underfunded and they're giving away their data because they can no longer afford the analytics that they would otherwise have to purchase? So it's a really important problem. And we're now, you know, the meaning of open in the United States is a little bit different than it is in Europe, where reciprocity is really an important thing. In, uh, in America, in, in the law, it really means that you just give away o uh, data for everything that's uh, generated by public money. So isn't this another example of the complexity of the situation <laughs> in the sense that um, there, when you talk about uh, like requiring companies to give back uh, generated analytics uh, because the data that they received was public, you're getting into issues of um, intellectual property, right. of which there's a huge body of law and a huge, uh, you know, a multitude of lawyers <laughs> there to adjudicate it. And they have deep pockets. <laughs> and do with deep pockets. And so, um, and in general, these companies have tended to, through their lawyers, to use traditional notions of, for example, intellectual property that evolved in the era of print yeah. and I extend them into the digital world in the most restrictive ways possible. So. I, it isn't, uh, the, uh, all I'm saying is, isn't the question it, one in which there isn't a quick fix. You can't just say, all right, well, now we'll require this to happen because it's going to have ramifications through a whole legal, uh, a sea of legal uh, and other, uh, you know, uh, legislative um, precedent. Absolutely. And this is one of these areas where computer and data scientists need to collaborate with legal scholars because this is exactly what's at stake here. Yes, another question. Uh, I have another. <laughs> I want to ask about the fate of institutions. We talked ah, about this this yeah. morning a little bit, and it seemed to me you were pretty pessimistic yeah. about the uh, resilience of many institutions in the face of this 
wave of digitization. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I'm actually, I sound like I'm very pessimistic, but I'm not. I think institutions can be very, especially public institutions, can be very resilient. And what I'm uh, witnessing right now is that a lot of public organizations are uh, joining forces to put up, you know, they really come to realize now that only by their uh, um, conjoint efforts can they really put up an alternative for corporate platforms. So I'm actually quite optimistic that this is going to be, you know, the new way in which public organizations are going to organize themselves. Uh, I mentioned this morning, I believe, that in the Netherlands, just over the past few months, I've been involved in the organization of a, uh, a sort of a public platform, public spaces, where public broadcast systems, educational institutions, uh, a lot of public institutions in the arts and sciences can now collaborate to really bring about an alternative to uh, the corporate platforms. And, you know, we may look at the very successful alternatives that we have created in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, very technical sometimes, but nevertheless, all of you are probably now using EduRoam in this room. That's one of the, everyone, you know, uses this in the world. And I think this is wonderful that we have created a educational, this is technical, but still, you know, we can really join forces and think about the collective power of public organizations. And I think that sort of awareness needs to bring back that resilience into institutions. Uh, resilient, you know, institutions cannot afford not to be resilient. So we have to come up with a solution that really empowers the public sector and protects public space that is, you know, paid for and made possible by people like us, right, from the public. What an end, <laughs> <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> um, and uh, I just want to uh, conclude that uh, we uh, also look forward to, to read your essay, which will be published in the, in the summer. Right. Yes, so we look forward to that. And I want to thank uh, Jay for moderating this uh, very mind provoking uh, seminar and of course uh, we want to give you some small memory from <laughs> fr from Malmö and I want to, that we all share in a very warm applause for this very nice lecture. Well, thank you very yes. much for thank having you. me here. Thank you. Thank you.